Thank you, everybody. And first off, thank you very much for Zometica for uh, inviting me and sponsoring us to do this webinar tonight. Um, for those, this uh, first picture is not a self-portrait, as some people have thought. Um, I will tell you my hair is grayer than that. So, all right, we're going to talk about some old and new things from, in dermatology laboratories. And um, one of the things that was funny is when one of my friends that I worked with when I was in Atlanta as a neurologist, and he said, oh, being a derm practitioner is so easy. All you need is a, a rusty old blade and some mineral oil and a slide, and that's all, that's all you need. And we've actually uh, gone a little bit further than that. So in fact, we're trying to, and even dermatology, embracing some of the, you know, not only our old things, but, you know, newer technologies, which I think are important. Um, I'm showing this tool set because this is a very nice looking tool set, one that I would be envious to own. Um, and, uh, and I think you could do a lot of great things with it. But as you know, technology has changed. That's my car. And you can't use that tool set alone to service my car. Um, these, you know, so we have to not to be afraid to embrace some of the new technologies that's, that's available for us while still recognizing the value of our older things too. Um, I got involved with Zometica through uh, a, a friend uh, who works there, named Bill Campbell, and he's a uh, he is a engineer, an engineer who um, has started working on a uh, on digital microscopy after a long career in the radiology field, and uh, he was like, "Oh, I, maybe you could be my beta test." And uh, so this is the first scope that Bill sort of brought to us to use. I said, "Bill." It's a bit cumbersome, I have to be honest with you. So no, I just, here's the, uh, this is an, obviously a scanning electron microscope. And for those of you who wanted to know what a Demodex mic looks like really up and personal, that's what they do. They're actually pretty cute if you think about it. So let's talk about what is it you wanna see and what do you wanna do in, as far as from a dermatology standpoint and as far as laboratory things. So the first things we start thinking about, number one, the skin scrapings, but we also talk, we use, um, you know, a lot of cytologies and of course, a lot of cultures. So when we do scrapings, what are the things we typically want to do? Well, we, um, you know, we certainly want to do things, look for things like Divid X, certainly scabies, Kylotella, Heladera. We always talk about these as something that, uh, you know, we always scrape to look for. Um, I will say that in uh, 39 years now of doing this, I've never seen it. So I don't know if anyone else has seen it, but uh, I, if you do, you're one ahead of me. Now, laughingly, people say, well, I mean, how hard is it to do a skin scrape? But after working with as many interns and externs and uh, uh, then over my, you know, time, I've been amazed on how, few, how many people don't actually do it properly. So again, if you don't do it right, then you're gonna have a hard time evaluating your results. Um, so how do you do it? Well, you gently squeeze the skin. I will say this one, it looks like someone's trying to squeeze this dog's eyelid a little more firm. And then you scrape until you get capillary oozing. So that's how you do it. It seems simple enough, and yet I've seen a lot of people who haven't done it properly. This is a skin spatula. These are I, what I use in my practice still. Um, I think, you know, you can certainly use a skin, uh, you know, a blade. Make sure you dull the blade. I, uh, my senior year, one of my classmates took a, uh, a rambunctious Dalmatian puppy and she decided she would scrape this dog by herself. And the next thing you know, uh, she hadn't dulled her blade, and we now were involved in emergency eyelid repair surgery. Um, so be careful, make sure your blade is dull. But these spatulas, the one in the center is one that I use, um, do a great job, and you can never cut an animal as long as you use a spatula. What do we look for? Well, we want to look at 4x power, and if you want to really um, to get the best possible view, it's not a bad idea to lower your condenser a little bit and start scanning. And I like to look for the, you know, the presence of mites, life stages, and I like to get counts. And I like to see what percentage are live versus what percentage are dead. And that's as important for as we watch, you know, as following therapy. Now, 
Um, some people will say to me, what, uh, you know, what are the life stages again? Well, there they are. It starts with an egg, goes to a larva with three undeveloped pairs of legs, moves on to the nymph stage, four undeveloped pairs of legs, to the adult with four pairs of fully developed legs. So that's how you can differentiate the, them all. So um, that, these uh, people say to me, well, we don't really see DMDX anymore. We every, all our dogs are on, um, you know, these isosoxylene uh, antiparasitic drugs and that's uh, eliminated DMDX. And I will be honest with you, you know, it certainly has reduced it by a huge amount, but don't, you know, people sometimes forget to give it. So you feel sometimes, you know, give, um, you know, give it inappropriately, you know, there's maybe they're giving, they're trying to save money and they're giving a lower dose. So, and it's still, we, you know, we still, if you don't look for DMDX, if you don't look for these things, you're not going to find them. Also, the, there are some thoughts that maybe some of the combo products, especially this one, Severica Trio. And again, I like Semperica very much and I like this product, but it, it seems as though Semperica is lower in the trio versus regular Semperica. And we see some veterinary derm people have felt that they have seen Demodex on animals that have been uh, on Semperica Trio um, and some of the other combo products, but it's this one in particular. Moving along, uh, you know, the same situation, of course, scabies is a, uh, a mite that we sometimes don't see, and but they're very responsive to therapy. Any sort of, if you see a mite, like you see on the right hand side here, or an egg would be a diagnostic, you know, a definitive diagnosis of scabies, but many of our cases are diagnosed through response to, you know, the therapy. Um, we, uh, we certainly, you know, often, you know, see, you know, don't see scabies nearly as much as we see um, demodectic mange. And of course, with these new products, um, it, we certainly see it even less. Now, again, just as a little caveat, I actually, you know, live now in, in uh, the Pensacola, Florida area in the Panhandle. And we most, you know, our patients are here on year round uh, flea control. And, but many of the people that were, you know, are in the attendance tonight, they very will be in places much further north um, where they have, um, you know, colder climates or some people, you know, owners will take them, their pets off, you know, in, you know, sort of late fall and not restart until the spring. Or perhaps when you think about these flea control products, what if you're in some of the areas that don't get fleas, you know, some of the, you know, sort of higher elevation areas in the, the mountains and the very, very dry areas out west. So again, just this is something else to, you know, to keep an eye on. But, um, you know, scabies, always a caveat, if you suspect a treat for it, especially if an animal's not on one of these uh, new antiparasitic drugs. In cats, um, we might be looking for things a little bit differently. If you look here in this corner, you, know, you see this little um, critter here came from an excoriated area on that cat that's on the left. And that's Demodex gatoi. That's the, um, that's the mite that actually is a Demodex mite, but in cats behaves much more like a scabies mite. That's the one that could be contagious. And that's the one that's typically, uh, you know, pyritic. Um, again, not something we see lots of, it's, uh, but there are certainly are areas in the country where they see it more. We in the Southeast, we're just not seeing it very much at all. Kind of a close up, but again, just look at the short stubby body, but still the four fully developed uh, leg pairs. So that's Demodex gatoi. And that's just in comparison, look how much smaller it is to Demodex cat eye. And the thing, when you look at cat eye, you might see that the, um, you much how, how much longer the tail is versus a canis mite. I don't know how many people have ever seen one of these. This is something I scraped from a Lhasa Apso, kind of in the mid back of sort of a very greasy area. And again, this is not a mite that we see with great frequency, but that's Demodex Ingi. It has an exceedingly very, very long tail, even longer than the cat eye mites and the cats.
Many pe people dealing with exotics will probably recognize what's coming next with this. This is a rabbit with a fair amount of paritis, and you can see the alopecia, the crusting. And this is Kylitiella parasitivorax. And this is something that is um, that can be contagious to other pets, certainly certainly contagious to other rabbits. The dog ones and the and the cat ones are different species, but they will they will go over and, and in fact um, they'll they'll cross species to to uh, change host. That's the the pincer people talk about the pincer palps. You can see those hooks, but that's what causes a lot of this itching and pain. They just thought this can be painful. So, anyways. Uh, I wanted to show this. This is uh, something we see with this is uh, one of the people who are exposed to that rabbit. Um, two things about this. So uh, I wanted to know want what this is. This is gross. This is disgusting. I will also tell you that in my experience as vet derm, that the more, uh, the more gross or disgusting the people are, the more they want to show me. So Anyways, but yeah, this is a, this is something that the person just whipped up their shirt and said, look at these. And I was like, oof, prefer if we did not look at that again. So this cat is uh, a paritic cat. And this is something that uh, I, this is the, I like to show this cat and people say, don't you have any better pictures? And the answer is no. This is the, in the almost 39 years, this is my N of one. That I've seen of this. And it doesn't, you know, when you look at it, it looks like a scruffy kitten, you know, probably. And if you said, well, the ears are phoretic, then you might think, like you should, that it, this cat is ear mice, but it had notoretic mange. So this is my N of one, one case of notoretic mange in a cat that I've seen. I don't know how many people, uh, I think that people in, if one place where I've heard people see this more, than others than I ever hear of anywhere else is in Texas, especially sort of the southern parts of Texas, Houston, Corpus Christi, you know, those areas that seem to have this more than anywhere else. But again, um, they're very, very, unlike in canine scabies, the feline scabies, my notoridries, um, are usually easy to find. And that's why I don't feel like we're missing them. But again, if you suspected it in any way, it's always best to treat for it. I don't know how many people or you are familiar and are using, uh, you know, incorporated hair plucks into their practice, but these are very, very helpful. Sometimes, uh, you know, it is in areas where it's difficult to scrape and that my special things are paused and especially the interdigital spaces. It's often not that easy to get a blade in there and get a good, a good scrape, but hair plucks are, exceed, are very, very helpful in these cases, also in deep pyodermic cases. You know, if we say, well, we're going to scrape until there's capillary oozing. Well, if there's capillary oozing or bleeding, frank bleeding, before we even start, how do you know when to stop? So that's why I like to use hair plucks in some of these cases too. And here you see, this is a pluck. And look at all the demodex mites that came out, you know, with these hairs. And it makes sense if they're living in the, uh, in the follicle. So you pull the hair out, they just come right with it. Okay, so let's talk for a few minutes about cytology and what are the things that uh, that I like to you know use it for. And really, these are the things: presence of bacterial inflammatory cells and yeast. Um, we primarily do it in the skin and uh, certainly the ears, and we use diff quick staining as our primary stain. And just remember, diff quick staining is not the equivalent of a gram stain. So when you look at you know bacteria. Remember, you only can tell the morphology. You cannot tell if it's gram positive, gram negative based on a diff quick stain. And, you know, just the simple, you know, the fixative, the, the red stain and the deep purple stain. So what are we really type primarily looking for? Really bacteria. And the bacteria we're looking for is staph. That's the one. So we want to see cocci. Um, you know, we're doing skin, 
uh, that's going to be our primary pathogen. Now, there are times where we might see other things too, but let's, you know, we're going to say, with what's the primary thing? And the same with yeast. Uh, it's going to be malassezia. That's the, uh, the yeast that we're looking for. How do we get our cytologies? Well, we do direct smears and we do tape preps. And a good way to, to, that I like to think of, it, I do direct smears on the more of the moist lesions and I use a tape prep if the lesion is real dry. Please always remember, and trust me, I cannot tell you how many cytologies I've looked at. You cannot evaluate cytology through frosted tape. It has to be clear tape. So, you know, if you don't you think, well, where do I get it for salt? You can get it everywhere. But, you know, even pack clear packing tape, if you cut it into a smaller strip, that's what you want to use. Should you heat fix your cytologies or not? Certainly seems to be sort of a, some people are very adamant that you need to, some people are very adamant that heat fixing causes artifacts and you don't want to. And then there's people like me who sort of waffle and so I use like a hair dryer and just sort of dry it that way with a little warm air and don't, I don't use a, a, a flame anymore to, um, to heat fix. But I am always af afraid of losing um, a lot of my material in the fixative when I don't. Um, 40X powers, I, I think lots of people tell me how they like to look at these at 10 and 20 and then they go straight to oil because 40 is so, um, so frustrating. I just remind you to really make your 40X work, you need to make sure you're using a cover slip. You know, it sounds simple, but yeah, you know, using, a, you know, some oil on your slide, putting a cover slip over it, then looking at it, that's the, the best way you're going to get good 40X um, 40x uh, resolution. Um, you know, this is a, a Westie. Uh, obviously, uh, we can see the chronicity. The, uh, the funny thing about this dog was uh, it wasn't, uh, for a long time, I thought that's what normal Westies looked like. And then I went to a dog show uh, when I was a resident. I went to the Westie class and I saw these white dogs and I didn't know what they were. And they said, uh, they said, well, those are Westies. And I said, not, a, not the way that I look at. So, But um, anyways, this is a dog who has sort of a, a, a separate coleosa, obviously tons of alopecia. And you can just see, you know, the skin is thickened. Um, so should you do a direct smear on this or should you do a, um, a tape prep? And the answer is either. They'll both work. So you're not right or wrong. Um, Real quick, just a, a fun reminder is that if you're going to do direct smears, always use two slides. Use one as a backing slide. Um, I tell people when I was a resident, I spent a lot of time at the medical school with the dermatology department there. And I was uh, privy to a, um, one of the derm residents and I were in a room and uh, trying to do a, a, a slide prep on a woman's rather large barrier. And, he broke the slide and it kind of stuck in her butt and uh, she was unhappy. And he looked at me and I'm like, <laughs> I'm a veterinarian, it's your, it's your deal. So uh, we sort of smoothed things over between her and stuff. But uh, it did impress on me that we always want to make sure we're using the two slides. Now look at this epidermal colorette around this um, nipple and stuff. This would be hard to do a direct smear uh, on, you know, so, I, so this is a, a really good example where I would want to use tape prep. I don't think this one is any question. On a colorette like this with this kind of scales and crust, if you want to do cytology, you have to use a, um, you have to use the clear tape. And look at this. I just actually just love, I took this picture not that long ago. But look at this, uh, this keratinus I just covered with malassezia. And, you know, again, looking here, what you would normally see, you know, kind of these, all these, you know, peanuts here everywhere. Um, and this, you know, a mast cell tumor with the, with the granules. A cat with these xenophilic plaques. This is, these are eosinophils that, uh, we got right off the plaque itself. So we were able to, you know, sort of just make that diagnosis of the eosinophil plaque on a cat and ruling out sort of like a mast cell tumor. 
um, just for this cytology. Saccharin sacred vet is zinc prep. Um, this is where we ask for a, um, an intact pustule. And if you don't have one, you can just lift up gently a crust and try to get underneath the crust. But what we're looking for is the, uh, hyper segmented neutrophils without bacteria and acantholytic cells. So this, if you realize this is, um, this is Arno Zank. He's the hematologist from France who sort of decided this technique and uh, he, uh, he got his name on it. So that's would be sort of a classic thing for a pentacus case. If we have a pustule, we aspirate it, we see hypersegmented neutrophils and uh, no bacteria. Now we're, and especially if we see lots of acantholytic cells, we, um, we would be very strongly suspicious or even sometimes diagnosing um, pampagus full, you know, a pampagus case. Now I cannot tell you looking at this slide, if this is pampagus foliaceous versus pampagus uh, um, vulgaris or even pampagus erythematosus, but hopefully you'll be looking at the, um, looking at the clinical case, you'll be somewhat helped in that. Now, does that mean I wouldn't do a biopsy in this case? I, for, if I'm an immune suppressive dog, I typically will biopsy them anyways, but I might start them earlier on therapy, um, at least the steroid part, if I had a really good zinc prep on a pustule like this. All right, let's, we're talking about cytology. So let's talk about um, ear cytologies. Here again, present to the bacteria versus yeast. Rods versus cocci, and most importantly, intracellular versus extracellular, and maybe the most important thing in my mind is cytology, much more valuable than ear cultures. In fact, I do not culture ears. Um, we see lots and lots of ear cases. We, uh, we, get, we get lots of them referred to us, and I never, ever culture ears. And we talk about this a lot on VIN uh, as well. Um, I find that ear cultures are incredibly uh, frustrating, partially because they're really not super accurate. Um, people talk to me about, you know, what, what antibiotic should I put in this dog's ear based on these culture results? And that's where we get the confusion. The culture is for, and the sensitivity shows, you know, typically um, just systemic blood levels. You know, if we had, you know, what, what antibiotic, if you were giving it orally and you're not doing that, you're putting, hundreds to maybe thousands of times more antibiotic than the blood level is into the ear. So that's number one. Number two, a lot of times the microclimate of the ear will not allow, even if you did choose the right drug based on the sensitivity, it may not work, you know, it might work in the laboratory, but it may not work in the Labrador retriever. The, the time because of scar tissue, because of inflammation, because of, you know, other changes, it may very well not work. Also, if you you want to lead an interesting study, you can look at Dr. Elena Cole from Ohio State did some studies where she cultured ears, sort of four different areas and got four different results. So I, I would urge you, save your client's money, save the time and asshole, do cytology. Cytology, cannot do enough cytologies, but I would not do cultures on ears. I never, I just never do. I also tell you, sometimes people say, oh, would you, Swab in ear, sometimes you do really need to stain it. Um, and uh, just because you can kind of know, you know what it is. And, you know, it's clearly if you have sort of a, a you know, you swab into an ear that smells horrible and uh, you pull out a big thing of pus, you realize it's going to be a bacterial infection for sure. But in, this year, I swabbed this one on the, and you can see, I looked at that thing and I said, oh, it's going to just be a yeast year. And I, but I stained it. And look what it stained. That's a bacterial infected ear. That's not a yeast ear. There's no yeast there. That's all, that's all protein. That's all degenerating neutrophils. There's bacteria in there. So don't think that you can just, you know, look at a swab and make your diagnosis. Take the time, you know, charge, you know, you're charging for it. Do it. You know, it's not a, it's the, it's the right thing to do. And it's also good to know exactly, not only it, what is the presence, but also the presence of the numbers. Is it, are you looking at one plus cocci versus four plus cocci? And everyone has their own sort of, you know, it's a subjective scale, but it, if you, as long as you're sort of consistent with it, then that, that works out well. Um, here my, you know, obviously 
This is something that's uh, kind of funny because I uh, I never see dermatitis. I was, this is a, a disease that is never referred to dermatology. In fact, I, I had this one cool picture and uh, I was lecturing in Asheville last year and one of the vets who was there, I was mentioned, he's like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even, I hardly have any pictures. She goes, oh, I just took a video of it on her iPhone. She sent it to me and uh, of uh, this, uh, this ear mite case. And um, uh, you know, just, so that was from her. But I thought it was funny that uh, we talked about, oh, I never see it. She goes, oh, I had a case yesterday and I took a video of it. Let me give it to you. So. Anyways, as you know, from looking at your, your cases, you see them, they're bountiful and they like, but I think the only thing they like to do is make uh, more of your mites though. Um, up in this left corner here uh, is a really interesting slide because I looked at those cells, I was like, um, this is really confusing. I, I didn't really know what those, I mean, I see the protein, I saw, you know, there's bacteria and stuff, but those will cells look weird to me. And um, sure enough, those are tumor cells. They're actually, this, this cat uh, had a, um, a squamous cell carcinoma that we diagnosed on, on cytology and then we confirmed it in, in removing the mass that was down in the ear. Um, so now let's talk for a second about digital microscopy. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I thought, this is an interesting thing because, you know, I think it's, uh, I love the idea of that we can look at things in a different way. Number one, number two, we can document and show owners and stuff. I think the more we show them, the more they appreciate what we do. So the, these kind of the two, the Zoetis um, uh, version on the right and Zometica's TrueView on the left. And that's the one that I use. Um, and just, you can see here's a, uh, a picture of uh, a case we saw yesterday, in fact, uh, um, um, and you can see this is a bacterial otitis and that turned out to be otitis and media that we're going to um, flush this dog's ear and allergy test it in the next uh, week or so. Um, but you can see what a nice image it is uh, to do. And, you know, I was able to just, you know, take a copy of this picture and email it to the primary care veterinarian. They could have it in their records. I sent it to the owners as well. So um, I think the digital microscopy is really, really, you know, really a, a fun thing to, to use. And it's, it's helpful too. Um, as far as in this case, more for an, I would think more for aspirates than most of our cytologies, but sometimes in cytology for, you know, a skin cytology that might be unusual, maybe it's a, a weird fungal thing like a histoplasmosis or blasto. Um, or nicardia, but you can then immediately send this off for a, a, a path consult, um, you know, through the TrueView, it's real, real easy just to request a consultation. And, you know, in a very short period of time, you get an answer back, which can be super, super helpful for, you know, uh, treatment options as well. Um, one of the differences that I think between the, uh, images in the Zometica TrueView that I really like, and I thought I'm gonna hopefully if this works and try to show you is that, um, you know, the, the staining process. I mean, you, you know, you think to yourself, how do you stain? And if you ask probably 10 veterinarians, they all tell you how to do difficult and uh, stains in probably 10 different ways. I mean, do you do it by time? Do you do it by dips? If you do it by time, is it 10 seconds and H1? Is it 10 seconds in the fixative and 20 and thir or 30 in the, the, the counter stains? Um, and the answer is, you know, I don't know that anyone really knows what the answer is. Someone once through one told me you should be 60 seconds in all three of them. Um, and it's sort of, you know, if you do that, and oftentimes it takes up time for your, you know, for you, if you're doing them, or hopefully not, but hopefully you, you know, your staff is doing it. So this is inside a true view, and this is kind of what happens. And so the slide just gets ingested, comes in, converts, goes in, goes to the staining platform. Yeah. There it's dried and stained. So you take sort of the, it's, so now it's consistent. You don't have sort of one tech doing it one way, one tech doing a different way. So 
I, I like this because, you know, in the images one, obviously you have to do the staining, then put it up there. It certainly puts up a nice image, but this, I still think part of the deal of getting good cytologies is getting good staining. So I really, really like, like that. Um, quick things on cultures. I, mean, I think almost everyone sends cultures out. If you are and you want to do like Remy, where we do lots and lots of cultures, there's sometimes we'll do them in house. So we do have an incubator and we, you know, obviously use our culturette. Real quick, uh, you laugh about this, but um, it happened to me. So I always want to try to bring it up. Um, make sure when whoever's handling your cultures knows how to open it and that this is the only part that they can touch. I've had multiple people holding this, you know, the, you know, the, the sh shaft part of the uh, culture and hand it to me and like, yeah, no, that, that's not now enough. We can't use that one now. We have to uh, get a new one. And they're like, oh, why? I didn't touch the tip of it. It's like, no, no, you can't touch any of it. You have to only do, do the, uh, the, the blue hole, the handle. Um, the color spot for the in-house just is, is a kind of fun thing. It, you know, you do different bacteria, do different colors. Um, dermatophyte cultures, uh, uh, you know, when we do this lecture, I always try to see how many people are still doing them in house. Uh, I actually prefer people to send them out. I, I don't do them in house. I always send them out when I do send them, um, because they, uh, they're not as easy to do as everyone sort of thinks. So it's like, oh, you just have this DTM media, you put some stuff on there and it turns red. Well, that is um, how it, it's supposed to work, but there's much more to it. One, it, it, all the fungal organisms will turn the media red. It's just a question on how quickly will they do it. Dermatophytes preferentially metabolize the proteins and change the pH over saprophytic organisms. So, but let's say you, like everyone else who's ever done a fungal culture, including myself, does one and then goes back, not one day later, but, you know, one week later, or, you know, even worse, and because they forgot, it was in the drawer, all, you know, in, in the dark, like they're supposed to be, and lo and behold, there's all kinds of, you know, fungal organisms on there, and the media is all red, so, um, so I, I still think it's better to change, to um, turn your, uh, just to send your fungal cultures out, um, what do we do? We usually, you know, culture either hair plucks, scale, or uh, hopefully you've heard of this, but the McKenzie brush technique, that's where we take a quote unquote sterile toothbrush, which I think is just a new toothbrush. And we brush, and this is typically for cats, um, especially a cat who might be a potential carrier cat, i.e. a long haired cat, like a Persian or a Himalayan. And we brush them from the, the uh, you know, basically for 10 minutes all over. And all the mixed scale and hair that we um, that we collect is submitted for culture or impregnated into our, our DTM uh, plates. Um, so that is uh, that's what we do. That's what the McKenzie brush technique is. Uh, this new PCR that has come out in the last few years, I do think it's a huge game changer. I think it's really accurate. Um, my you know should you I I think ideally we like to do both. But if, if I really, truth be told, if I, especially if I needed an answer quicker than, than uh, you know, because of a situation, it was a problem, I would do a PCR over a fungal, uh, over a fungal culture. But like I said, ideally you could do both. Here's a, you know, a positive uh, microspore and canis. Um, and just for these white fluffy colonies. Now, not all dermatophytes are white and fluffy like M. canis is. But the reality is they're always white or tan. They're never blue, black, green. You know, if you ever see that, you don't have to despeciate it because those are not, you know, those, those are not. They're always white or a light tan. They're not, they're never, you know, those deep colors that you see. Um, this is M. Now, so this is why I like to send my cultures out because how many people then go and do, you know, we take lacto cotton phenol blue stain and get macroconidia and stain it to, to, to differentiate the species. And, um, you know, here's microsporum canis, more than six compartments, a very thick wall. But 
That's microsporum gypsum, although I believe it has now has a new name. But you can see always less than six compartments in a thinner wall. And it's important to know why, um, you know, where, what organism you're dealing with. Microsporum gypsum is a soil organism. So when do I see that? I see that with dogs who are diggers, you know, especially this is one that you often see on the, uh, the nasal bridge. Important to rule out an autoimmune disease is you can have a lot of nasal bridge disease, but not the plantar nasality. And, you know, dermatophytes don't aff only affect hair follicles. So since there's no hair follicles in the plantum, they'll never have, you know, disease there on a, um, in a dermatophyte in infection. And again, M. gypsum, you know, you'd want to know if it's an M. gypsum versus an M. canis, or, um, you know, even the case of a trichophyton, which are even harder because they really don't produce good macroconidia, they're more on microconidia, um, you know, cases. Trichophyton, we, we had a, a case in a, a dog who was really confusing because this dog had horrible paws and claws, and it truly had onychomycosis. And when we were able to, um, get a, a diagnosis of the organism, it was trichophyton mentagrophytes. And that was important to know because, uh, and it was very frustrating because this dog also had pemphigus foliaceus. So we were trying to immune suppress a dog who had a, a raging trichophyton infection. So that was not an easy task to do. But what's important was that the, the, this was a young, uh, the daughter in this family had, had required a guinea pig and that guinea pig didn't have any lesions, but was a carrier for the trichophyton. So that dog, that I mean, guinea pig ended up infecting the child, both parents and the dog in a very short period of time. So it was important to figure out which organism we were dealing with so that we could you know, identify that the guinea pig was the culprit. Well, and you say to me, do, what does a dermatologist do with CBCs? We look at them, believe it or not. And some of the things we look for are, are we looking at elevated white counts and some of our active infections? It is amazing to me how sometimes a dog can have a raging pyoderma and have really very little elevation of the white count, but some of them do. But what about elevated eosinophils? I mean, certainly uh, in cats who have eosinophilic plaques, we might see a very high eosinophilia. Um, I think my record so far is like 38,000. So almost someone was, was wondering if this cat maybe had leukemia, but it wasn't. It was just an eosinophilia secondary to the, um, you know, to its eosinophilic uh, plaque disease. And of course, anemia of chronic disease. A lot of our animals are taking chronic meds and they have chronic pyodermas and stuff. So we sometimes see anemia of chronic disease as well. And the chemistries, Albumin may be low. Why? Because some of these dogs and cats are losing proteins, and especially albumin, through oozing and weeping sort of, uh, you know, infected areas. So we often see globulins be elevated in active infections, and many of our animals may have ALP and uh, ALT elevations. But now let's go for a second and talk about endocrine. And this is where I think things got real, real exciting too in the last year for me is the, the, when I first got a true forma um, in my office. And uh, this true forma is in my mind, I mean, I use it today and again, it's just a, a, a life-changing thing for me as a dermatologist. And these are the things that it can assay, total T4, then this is really an really good one for me, canine TSH, endogenous TSH. We've never been able to do that accurately in, in my years as a veterinarian. Um, feline TSH, also incredible, not as much as important for me, but as an internist, free T4 cortisols and ACTH. Again, um, these are uh, you know an endogenous ATH level. I mean, this is something that we couldn't hardly do in any, when I was teaching at the university. So um, these are great. Now, since this is this decided to come in, we also, they've added now um, exocrine pancreatic uh, uh, enzyme sort of uh, capabilities to true forma. I, as a dermatologist, don't use this, but I know for the pancreatic exocrine in insufficiency dogs, you're getting answers very, very quickly. And uh, so um, this is a, uh, 
I, like I said, I think this is a real exciting thing for us to, to look at. Um, for you, just to remember, wow, how does this all work? Remember, the hypothalamus will stimulate the pituitary gland through TRH, and then it elevate, it sends its message to the thyroid gland via TSH, and it, of course, it has negative feedback from T3 and, and uh, T4, um, and that, of course, there's, there can be total T4 and free T4, but they're all sort of negative feedback. Uh, interesting, if you think about how, how accurate the TSH level is, I mean, if anyone who has hypothyroidism in, in, a, in their own self or a spouse, because it is certainly more, you know, and it's more common, I would see, in women than it is in men. But if you go to your internist and they suspect hypothyroidism, they're going to measure a TSH level. That, they don't measure free T4 and T4. They just measure TSH. It's really the most accurate thing we could do. So this is, this is Barley, and he has lots of stuff going on. He has chronic, he's, he's atopic. He has stenotic ear canals that were, that, that were recommended to be ablated. So we've been trying to save his ears. And um, we, um, you know, with, through really good owner and through lots of really tough work, we've got the canals opened up enough. So I do think we're going to save his ears from from the surgery, from the surgeons at this point. But she mentioned that um, she, uh, she just thought he was sort of not quite as peppy as he used to be, but he's also, he's gotten older and he's, his ears hurt and he's, you know, so I sort of, I really wasn't so keen or keyed in on the fact, could this dog be hypothyroid? But she brought it up because she's hypothyroid. And I said, well, let's just for fun, check and just see. And sure enough, within 30, you know, I guess 45 minutes, uh, Barley was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Look, he has an elevated TSH level. And we decided just for fun, what we measured his T4 is unmeasurable. It was less than 0.5. And uh, this, we had actually sent that out. And so he truly was hypothyroid. It wasn't that, you know, he had sick euthyroid syndrome, which is something that another thing, the TSH level will be invaluable in um, determining true hypothyroidism versus sick euthyroid because this dog has been on chronic disease. He's been on he's been on steroids. He tried to open his ear canal. He's been on topical steroids. So this dog had lots of reasons to have a low T4, but he wouldn't have reasons to have an elevated TSH unless he was truly hypothyroid. Um, endogenous ATH can certainly differentiate from uh, endogenous and iatrogenic forms of Christian disease. More accurate than the low dose decks. I guess this is sort of debatable. Um, there, are, I, I think that it's really a if you have a, you know an elevated ACTH level, um, that is a pretty strong indicator. But apparently, I think if you talk to endocrinologists, they say some normal dogs will have elevations at times of the ACTH, but I think still it's it's a great screening test for me. You know, for so you know, if a low dose dex is an eight hour deal, you have to you know, you know, take three blood samples and give an injection. This is one blood stick, and you know, forty five minutes later or so, you have an answer on as far as that goes. Everyone knows what this is. Everyone wants to guess this. If I told you those lesions are super firm, but look how this dog has all this thinning of the skin. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving in here, but that's how the, the blood vessels are so prominent. The blood vessels aren't really changed. What's happened is you have lots of thinning of the skin. So now they're so close to the, in proximity to the epidermis that that's why they look so, um, they look so prominent. So that dog has what we call hypotonia and flea bactasia. Um, and this is calcinosis cutis. This is close up, you see these firm crusty lesions there. They, um, if you squeeze sometimes every now and then you get lucky, you, squeeze, you can almost see calcium, little calcium deposits come out. A different dog who also had signs of Cushy's disease and look at this tail. That, if you want to say, what is, what is a, and you can see how, you know, this dog is a, is a, a long haired white shepherdy mix and that's not right. So that is a, uh, that is a, that is a rat tail if you've ever seen one. Um, both of these cases turned out when we looked at their cushions, you know, for cushions, 
they're both iatrogenic. And both cases were allergic dogs who had had a lot of repeated depomedrol injections uh, and endogenous ATH levels exceedingly low, ACTH stimulations uh, were blunted. So this is iatrogenic Cushing's disease. So again, I urge you to avoid using depomedrol and long-term steroids uh, in all these cases. Quickly, I mean, dermatopathology is something that I think is uh, something we should talk about. Not that you're going to do this in, you know, you're not reading your own slides and, you know, do processing, but just to do, I, I, when I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, um, you know, we, would all, we would go once a week to, for derm path rounds, and we would read cases from veterinarians in the area who had sent in for evaluation. And then, of course, as a clinical dermatologist, I often had to call these, owner, these veterinarians and talk to them about the results, especially when they would call and say, well, that was a waste of money for my client. I didn't get any, any results there. And they, was a white, and they would be upset. And, you know, the problem, you know, as we sort of say, and sort of garbage in equals garbage out. If you take a bad sample, you're going to get a bad result. So make sure you send the pathologist a, 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 an adequate and good sample. How do we do that? Never, ever scrub a skin lesion that you're going to biopsy. The crust and the superficial layers may actually be exactly where the, uh, the answers are. So we never ever scrub a lesion. Always use a fresh new punch. These are disposable punches. They are not that expensive. Do not attempt to sterilize them through gas acid autoclaving or cleaning them real well with Cydex or whatever. They are a one and done sort of deal. Um, some people have told me, you, they've been taught you can only turn the punch in one direction. And I can tell you, um, I've always turned it in both directions. I always did this sort of twisty motion. Um, I asked, I literally asked my pathologist uh, a couple of years ago, because a dermatologist, I was, I was at a derm lecture and he, he strongly said, you can never ever use a twisty motion. And I went up after him. I was like, who, who told you that? And he said, I don't know, somebody. And I was like, well, I can tell you, I've done it for that, the, the twisty motion. And I don't, I've never had a problem that I know about. And I've read some, you know, I've obviously even seen my own cases and I, they look fine. So I asked my dermatopathologist and I said, does it matter? She says, absolutely not. So if you want to do, you know, if you're one of the ones who want to turn it one direction, good, no problem. If you want to do the twisty motion, fine. Make sure you do it right. Start. Once you start, you're committed. You do not start, stop, start, stop. Once you do, you twist and you know, whichever way you're doing it until you're, you know, basically buried your punch. Make sure your skin is taut. So you see the, you know, the hand is sort of holding the, uh, um, the skin taut. Grab from the base. So you use a, don't use a, uh, use a rat tooth forcep and, and, you know, just the one by two is like preferable um, and grab from the very base. And that's where you use your Metzenbaum scissors to cut. Don't put a big uh, rat tooth serration into the middle of the punch. Always grab from the base. And don't use anything but Metzenbaum scissors. They're sharp, they're, they're, they do the best cut. Don't use Mayo scissors. Don't use your Olsen Hager needle drivers. This, these are not the best things to use. Use a Metzenbaum scissors and, and cut from the very, very base. Make sure you have the punches given, you have a, a nice size punch, I mean, a, you know, four probably should be the most of the time, you know, minimum six and eight are ideal. Um, Except for at certain areas. I mean, you cannot use an eight millimeter punch and biopsy a dog's plantum nasality. That's, you know, you can't do an eyelid of that. But if you send a pathologist one two millimeter punch biopsy, you're going to have a very unhappy pathologist and probably get a crummy report. So make sure you send, you know, multiple, say two, three. And people say, should, where should I biopsy? Always biopsy a primary lesion if possible. If you're biopsying, you know, across an ulcer. And I think it's always a good idea to biopsy, you know, sort of on the edge of it. So you maybe get a little bit of normal skin and mostly ulcer, you know, too. But, you know, those are the, those are the tricks to trade. And here's the pemphigus foliaceus case. And look at the, where the, the action is. That's a subcorneal pustule filled with 
these hypersegmented neutrophils and um, and uh, acantholytic cells, you can see that it's it's spanning two hair follicles down on the below. You can see the two hair follicles. But if you would have scrubbed this lesion prior to biopsy, you would have a problem. You would not be able to. Uh, you would have missed the diagnosis. You could not. If you, all that crust and the, you know the, the pustule is taken away, you would not be able to make this diagnosis. Okay. Well. I'm thankful for you guys to uh, spending a, close to an hour or so. I did want to show you one thing. People have asked me about your pets, and uh, I will show you. That's um, my dog, Alvin, is the, uh, is the Cavapoo, and uh, the Pomapoo in front is Kona, and that's Barb's dog. And why do I show this? And I was like, well, because they're doodles. Um, and I was it really anti-doodle when they first came out? I will tell you, I thought, oh my God, people are nuts. They're paying, you know, thousands of dollars for mixed breed dogs. It's just the craziest thing ever. You know, it's like, I think P.T. P. P. Barnum is laughing and stuff. And I thought, oh, you know, and then over the years, the, uh, the uh, sort of, the doodles won me over. I, you know, I sort of think, bad. they're so smart. They don't shed. They're really nice dogs, and uh, so now I have gone to the dark side, and we now own two doodles. But I also started thinking, does this ever happen in nature? And so, uh, you know, as a scuba divers, and uh, we we see different things. So on the top here, you can see that's a nurse shark, and on the bottom, um, that's the uh, the toadfish. It's super common in uh, in, uh, um, in the waters in the Gulf of Mexico near, near us here in the Panhandle, but you see them other places, but uh, some people uh, have called them the mother-in-law fish because they're really ugly. And uh, I guess it depends on your mother-in-law, but uh, I said, well, that's kind of curious, but why do I show that? Because we went to Indonesia this, this last December and that's the Wobegon shark. And I thought, oh my God, nature's own doodle. That's a combination of the toadfish and the nurse shark. Is that, but these are really cool. They are what we call carpet sharks. They lay like, they're ambush predators that lay down on the, on the uh, ground. I mean, when I tell you they camouflage well, I literally put my hand on this one uh, once before I even realized it was there. So anyways, but they're super, they're super cool. They're, you know, about four to six feet long, um, uh, but they're, uh, they're, they're really funny, but I thought, oh my gosh, look, nature has its own doodle.